Hi everyone and welcome to In Deep Geek Live. Today we've got a great lineup. I've got two guests today because we've got two great subjects we're going to be uh, talking about. I think we'll start by introducing my two guests. First of all, uh, JR, do you want to say hi? Absolutely not. Ladies first. Heidi? Uh, thanks, JR. Hi, I'm Heidi. Um, I'm with Costume Co. and I'm here with Robert to talk a bit about the costumes of Game of Thrones. JR. And I'm JR from Geek Chat One. Uh, thank you for having me, Robert. Pleasure as always. Excellent. Well, guys, uh, you may or may not know these people uh, already. Uh, Heidi, I had you on here, I think, uh, probably about a year or so ago on this channel. Uh, so it's yes. fantastic to have you back on again. Heidi is my go-to costumes expert. <laughs> and so the first thing we're going to be looking at today are the uh, the pictures that uh, have been released from Game of Thrones Season 8, uh, official pictures. There's a link down in the description if you want to go and click on the link now and have a look at those because we'll be talking about them in just a second. Uh, JR is the head honcho, I don't know if that's his official title, <laughs> head honcho of Geek Chat One, which is a, a fantastic group over on Facebook that I'm a member of, and also a brand new channel that I would highly recommend you go and check out. Links down in the description. So guys, we're going to run this in the way that we normally run this, um, in that uh, I've got a whole load of questions from my patrons that we're going to be working our way through. Obviously, if there are any super chats, we'll also get to them as and when they come uh, come in. Uh, but uh, we did get one super chat uh, from uh, Maura Lee. Thank you. Uh, you are such a star, Maura. And thank you. Your now traditional uh, pre-stream uh, super chat. Uh, just saying no questions, just love and support for all the great content and great stories. Thank you, Maura. I really appreciate it. Thank you. That's uh, that's wonderful. But let's get straight into this. Uh, the reason I've got uh, Heidi on here, Heidi's on here for the first part of this show, uh, is to talk about these costumes. Now, uh, why don't you just start at, at a high level? What are, what are we looking at? What, what, what has been released? Well, uh, unfortunately, we were just saying we don't have any pictures, but uh, so we, we had a picture of Bran, and I mentioned to you that it's actually the same costume that he's worn last season. He, that costume was introduced then. We also have one of Sansa, and she it looks like she's in Winterfell, and she, again, is wearing one of the three gowns that she wore last season that Michelle Clapton designed for her. Uh, we also have Davos, and He's had that costume for a couple of seasons. I actually love it a lot. But uh, one of the things I mentioned to you, Robert, is that I did notice that there was an Unsullied standing behind him. So perhaps uh, he, he's back in Dragonstone. I don't know what your thoughts were on that. And then uh, finally, Brianna, uh, she also is wearing her same armors that she wore last season. The cloak is the same. I'm really hoping to maybe see some new costumes on these folks, but uh, it looks like our core cast are the ones that probably are going to be where the money is going to be spent. So those are the ones that we're going to sort of talk about right now. What do you Absolutely. Think of that? I think one of the things that you were saying early on uh, yeah. was that, uh, or when we were talking before, was that these are deliberately low resolution so we're not this isn't mm. about the, the the background the scenes everything uh, this is about just a look at these characters and what their costume is going to be and mm -hmm. I think what I'd like to dig into and I've got a few questions I will throw at you in a moment from my patrons what I want to dig into is what might these costumes particularly any costume changes mean for the characters um i think i'll just quickly throw to uh to jr for any quick thoughts before coming to you for sort of some expert analysis jr did you have any thoughts on this uh with the costumes that the ones that stood out to me the oh, most were obviously jamie which, which i pulled up varus is very subdued for his typically mm -hmm. flamboyant uh garb that he wore in the south or even in essos uh, it's way more subdued, way more in uh, the stark colors and, and uh, more of the earth tones. So that's a little bit telling that he is going to be at Winterfell. Jamie wearing northern armor for a northern fight uh, makes complete sense to me. Brienne, uh, again, a little bit more northern here. And, and, you know, it's all the characters are basically showing up in the north at this point in time. So it kind of stands to reason that they would be uh, dressed to suit the weather. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, 
No, what, what I was going to say is, we, Robert, you were just mentioning about the resolution of the pictures, and this oftentimes happens when they do a release. They show low-res pictures, and unfortunately, it makes it difficult for people like me because then I can't zoom in on the details. Uh, however, the pictures are really well done. They're done by Helen Sloan. She's the uh, principal photographer for the series, and she always does a really great job. Uh, they're not actually usually taken from the show itself, but they are done uh, purposefully for this purpose, like for S stills. So um, what I noticed, uh, the course is, you know, we're, you were just mentioning that, JR, is the, the downplaying of color. This has been a, a constant theme that's happened over the last few years. And Michelle Clapton has basically stated that it's a shutting down of color to show the, uh, the seriousness, the tone that she's trying to set for the characters. And so no bright, you know, fanciful colors, no soft flowing gowns. Everything's a little bit more weighty. Of course, it's uh, winter, it's getting colder. So we're seeing these heavier textured fabrics. Uh, we're seeing a lot of fur that's being incorporated, obviously. So one of the things I noticed is that uh, Tyrion, for instance, his cloak that he's wearing has fur lining, as does Varys's, and of course Danny. She has a lot of fur that's been incorporated into her costumes, also some leathers. So we're getting into more like sort of almost, um, well, Michelle Clapton likely isn't using real fur, but we're getting into more like animal hide type fabrics. So did you want me to go through the specific uh, characters? Well, or? Yeah, so I think there are three that really stand out. I mean, I think that sure. this is this is a really important point that you're saying, that these, these aren't necessarily shots from the show. Mm -hmm. These are promo pictures as much as anything else. But we can learn a lot from the costumes. Now, I had some questions uh, just to pick up on, first of all, Danny. So if you could talk about Danny's one. Uh, I had Karuna uh, Timkova, who was one of my patrons, saying LML, who is often in the chat here, I haven't seen whether he is here today, uh, but he mentioned on Twitter that Danny's new coat makes her look like a weirwood tree. Mm -hmm. um, love to hear Heidi's thoughts on this. Could be this be a way of ingratiating herself to the Northerners, something to do with solidarity with John. So, what 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 do you make then of the of Danny's look? Is it the same look as last season? Has it changed? And and if so, mm -hmm. what do you think it's trying to say? Well, that's really funny that she said that about the rarewood tree because I uh, I I'm uh, friends with another fellow online called the Dragon Demands, and he said the exact same thing. Uh, that it looked like a weirwood tree, like the trunk of a weirwood tree, and that it's like the blood seeping out, which is possibly the symbolism, but I think more likely it's meant to represent Danny's house colors. So last season, uh, if you guys remember, she was wearing a coat that was very similar. There's been some discussion about whether it had the red in it, and I want to just shout out to Asen and Jennifer. They're my two pals on, uh, on Twitter who we often chat about the costumes. Definitely there was no red in that costume. However, she did have a little bit of red creeping in to a few of her other Targaryen sort of inspired costumes, usually by way of a little bit of embroidery, maybe a little bit of beading, like some Swarovski crystals here and there. But with the, the dim lighting, it was really hard to actually see the red. But Michelle Clapton did say that that was purposeful. She didn't want to throw the red right out there, so she just did it very, very subtly. And this is where I was talking about in terms of being able to zoom on on the pictures, you could see it. So that brings us to this white coat that she's wearing, which is definitely, it's not quite a, a, a bright red. It's a little bit like a maroon or maybe like almost plum-like red. And it's in the cracks of the, you know, it's sandwiched in between the fur, but she also has the cape and then she has a bit of a, like a cravat that she's wearing with the accents of red. So I think those are meant to represent her colors as, uh, and I think as the season goes on, I'm hoping we're gonna end up with like more and more red uh, as we go along in season eight. That's what I'm hoping at any rate. Yeah, I, th I think that's, that's a really good pickup about the house colors. Uh, mm -hmm. particularly given the fact that everybody seems to be dressed here in greys and blacks and you know very Batman-y colours to be honest um, and then we get these little hints of red so she's not abandoning who she is just because she's in the north we had a couple of mm -hmm. super chats I want to very quickly pick up on uh, thank you so much uh, uh, by the way guys this is this is great uh, time for a kiss uh, just asked who is the most beautiful woman in Game of Thrones this is obviously very subjective uh, guys I will allow you when when Whenever you next speak, I will allow you to uh, to pick up on that one. Uh, I, I 
couldn't possibly put, uh, say other than many beautiful women, Miss Sande and Melisandre both stand out for me. Yeah. Um, uh, in terms, uh, we had another super chat from uh, Merit of Abydos. Thank you so much. Uh, 22 euros. Uh, just saying thanks for awesome work. Uh, that is very kind. Thank you very much. Uh, I think we've got a, a question from you actually uh, from over on Patreon that we'll be picking up soon. And then Ma Rion. Uh, wow, 55 euros. That is incredibly generous. Saying, just like to thank you. Always a pleasure to view your videos. Thank you. I, I, I'm blown away by the support. That's that's exceptionally kind of you. Um, uh, why don't we quickly pick go over to JR? Did you have any thoughts either on Danny's costume or who the most beautiful women are in Game of Thrones? Uh, it's a laundry list of beautiful women in Game of Thrones. They're all amazing actresses, and they're all inherently beautiful in their own way. So. Uh, if I had to pick one, if you're going to pigeonhole me to the corner, I would say Marjorie. I've always been a Marjorie guy. Mm -hmm. Excellent. And, and did you have any thoughts on Danny's uh, th this idea that yeah, the, 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 the red, the red, in, the red in, the, in the cape? I really like the, the contrast of colors between that. And it is bringing out the, the dragon side of her, too. But it also kind of, for me, parallels what John's going to find out here very shortly uh, being uh red and being gray of a stark so to me it's kind of a play with that too which is always interesting yeah and uh, Teresa Mida over on patreon uh just was asking this same thing actually about the the red flare of danny in her clothes whether it's embracing her targaryen heritage uh i think this is true i think this mm -hmm. is just herself keeping uh keeping this this identity going um can we look at uh Jamie next. Now, now I've had a few people ask me about this. Kid28 on, on Patreon was saying uh, it appears that Jamie is wearing at the very least northern if not stark armor, very reminiscent of Rob's. And I've seen a few people yeah. in, sort of in, over on Twitter and various other places saying it looks like Jamie is wearing Rob Stark's armor from somewhere around season two or three or whenever it was. Yeah. Uh, is it the same? And or is it specifically Stark armor that he's wearing? No, it's not. Well, at least it, the coat isn't. So uh, the coat that he's wearing is from. You're asking me, right, Robert? Sorry, I'm just checking. Yeah, yeah, I was asking you. <laughs> um, the coat actually, he wore that last season. So he wore it at the very uh, season seven, sorry, uh, episode seven, as he was leaving King's Landing. And what it is, it's kind of like uh, a, I call it a jacket of plates. So it's it's a leather coat, a leather jacket with detachable sleeves and then on it are sewn uh, like uh, actual steel plates so that's definitely different than what we see on uh, Rob Stark or, or any of the Stark armor which is usually a uh, brigandine a coat of plates sandwiched between leather so now the gorget which is the collar however is very similar but I actually think that the collar I think I mentioned this to you looks um, more like uh, the hound that he wore and and then the pauldrons which are the shoulder guards so what I what was significant to me is that you know normally uh, normally Jamie would wear something with a lot of um, uh, you know, bas relief, a lot of like texture, like you'd have the either the lion on there or it'd be engraved, like you would see in the King's Guard. So what we see here is all of that is stripped away. It's very simple. Uh, to me, it states that he has no allegiance to a guard, to a queen, to a house. That's sort of my the impression I'm getting. Right. So it, it's not uh, Rob Stark's uh, armor, then, just to be clear. In my humble opinion, no. <laughs> okay. Um, and do you personally uh, sort of take any significance to the fact that there's, at least from what I could see, no Lannister markings on this at all? Yeah, so that's basically that's basically an F you to, to Cersei, her kingdom, um, to his family. Uh, says to me that he's done with it, and he's going off to help looks to me like he's gone off to help John in his cause. 
Okay. JR, is there anything? Oh, no, go on. I was just going to say one other thing. It is a very good set of armor, though. And I, I, as I mentioned to you, like in terms of Game of Thrones armor, you know, on a scale of 1 to 10, it's very good armor. I would say it would be really good armor if it had chainmail underneath it. Um, without chainmail, not so great because it's just leather and leather cuts quite easily. But the plates are definitely a, a really great add. Fantastic. Uh, JR, is there anything you'd like to add on that one? So, like, like uh, Heidi was saying, so the armor here, the, the well, we, you call it Jurgen, a doublet, or a Gamison, just depending on which style it is for actual armor. It yeah. is stitched in, but it has exposed plates, like Heidi was saying. It's not the, the typical quilted, which is uh, backed with leather and, and sandwiched with leather, leather, which is uh, more like what Ned Stark wore down south. The famous picture of him on the Iron Throne with ice. That's the the sort of Winterfell doublet that she's talking about, which is it, it isn't a doublet actually. Yeah, it's, it's, a, actually it's a it's a, a, yeah, a brigand or a brigandine. I'd say it's yeah, a brigandine. A brigandine yeah. yeah, yeah, same styling. There's so when it comes to medieval armor, guys, it's really hard because every single piece of armor has about nine hundred different names to go with it, and it depends on period. It depends on where it's coming from on the difference of the names. Uh, the gorget, uh, it's not as tall in the collar and the neck as Rob's was. A lot of people mm -hmm. have said that it looks a lot like Rob's. It, it kind of does. It's reminiscent of it, but it's certainly not Rob's armor. I don't think Jamie is going to stop in the twins to pick up Rob's armor before he goes north to make a great impression on everybody up there, right? It's a little bit out there for me. So this is the one that everybody seems to be uh, globbing on to and talking about because it seems to be the most controversial or what's going on with him kind of deal um but from this we can only really extrapolate that one he gets to the north two that he's going to be in the fight of the north and three that he's sitting at a table being welcomed which means nobody put him to the sword when he first got there so that's about all you can really get from this yeah and then i mean he would have had that that coat uh in king's landing he would have had it in his wardrobe because he he leaves king's landing or he stopped by the armor on the way to town and, and picked it up so he's he's obtained that from the south not from the north so yeah. if you guys go back if you guys want to go back and look at the images from season seven you'll see what i mean he just doesn't have the additional armor pieces on top of it uh, it's just a leather tunic with the with the plates on it, and the the other accessories aren't there. Yeah, I think so. So my summary then of Jamie uh, from this picture is that he uh, it, he has changed away from his Lannister identity very clearly in what he's wearing here. He hasn't. It, contrary to what some people seem to be thinking, taken on board with the full Starkishness. This isn't a Rob Stark's old armor, but it's a lot more sort of neutral and it's a lot better suited to being in the North. And as JR was pointing out, the fact that he's there and he's smiling does seem to imply that he gets to the North and that he doesn't get immediately beheaded. So mm -hmm. I think that there are, there are some things that we can, we can pull out from that. Absolutely. Um, uh, Heidi, I also wanted to pick up on uh, a question. Um, this is from Merit of Abydos, actually, uh, saying about John, who's not wearing the breastplate with the Stark sigil any longer. So, has John also had a change of costume? Okay, so John's costume, uh, I, I mentioned this to you, Robert, as well. He is wearing the same cloak, the same uh, collar, you know, the direwolf collar. But he is missing his uh, coat of plates, like his, his gambeson, and he's just wearing kind of a simple tunic, like a leather tunic. So I'm not sure what that's all about. I just, for me, it, it sort of said that maybe he's just trying to be less threatening. Maybe he was going home and he decided, well, I don't really need to be wearing my armor. So yeah, there it is. Um, sort of like a, a distressed type leather. It's laced in the front. It likely goes down to his knees. This is usually the type of thing that they wear under their armor, under their coat of plates, and then the gorget. So it could just be that he took it off. I'm not really sure the purpose of it. So hopefully we'll find that out. You know, he's there with his sweetheart. <laughs> yeah. Or, so, his, or his aunt. <laughs> or well, he doesn't know she's his aunt the, yet. The, it's the... the, the <laughs> As Targaryens don't care about these things. Let's let's be honest. Um, yeah. uh, JJ, is there anything you wanted to add about John's costume? Yeah, for this, 
and like we said earlier, a lot of these are going to be post pictures specifically for uh, public consumption that may or may not be in the show. I don't, I don't think a lot of these are going to end up in the show. Although Jamie's kind of looks like it was probably taken and set in scene. This one kind of looks like it, but again, you know, this is a softer look for John. He doesn't have any armor pieces on whatsoever. So he's somewhere that he's comfortable where he doesn't feel threatened, uh, which given the snow could be, it's gonna be somewhere north of the neck. I'm not even gonna speculate on where, but neither of them are armored. Uh, he doesn't even appear to be carrying long claw in this picture. Yeah. So, so it, to me, it's just kind of like a, it's a their picture, but this would be typical of somebody that, that doesn't feel threatened. Yeah. So yeah, as, she, on... as she mentioned, yeah, sorry, Jr. He, yeah. So normally he has a belt, and then he has a sword belt. So that's completely missing his sword belt. Correct. Yeah. So, so I think now we're in the territory. Are these uh, promotional shots, or are these shots from episode one? And I don't think with things like this we can necessarily actually tell the difference, to be honest. So, yeah. um, I, I think I wouldn't draw too many conclusions from it, other than what, given the amount of shots we've got that look like they're Winterfell-based, what we originally thought, which was episode one of season eight, is almost certainly going to be the big Winterfell get-together with everybody just meeting up with everybody and, and all of the things that we've been wanting to see with Sansa and Tyrion and Arya and Jon and, 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 and the Mormont reunion and all these different things will happen. So that, that'll take up a whole episode, I'm sure. So it makes sense to me if for an episode at least they're not there with their swords out and, and fighting things. Yeah. Um, <laughs> just wanted to, uh, in terms of the Super Chats, uh, uh, Benjamin Johnson, thank you so much. Twenty dollars. We'll get on to your question if that's okay. When we're talking uh, just about uh, Cersei uh, in a few minutes' time. Uh, lost for words. A uh, hundred pounds. Wow. Thank you so much. Uh, I really appreciate, and and you know how much I appreciate uh, all that you do uh, for for me in this channel. Um, saying because Jen the Muse and I love costumes. Great to have Heidi on here. I certainly agree with that. It is fantastic oh, to have Heidi back on. Um, uh, so. So while we do have you on here, um, Heidi, is there any, any of these other costumes that you would like to draw to our attention? I, um, I, I noticed sure. uh, when you gave me your notes beforehand, you said that Sam is wearing the exact same costume that he's been wearing for about four or five seasons now. Yeah, it's. I mean, he's, he, there's been occasion where he's had the furs on it when he's been north of the wall, but basically it's the same thing. It's a gambeson, it's uh, leather, it's quilted leather, it's got uh, some of the rivets in it, which usually means that there should be some um, metal behind it. And, you know, he came, Michelle had mentioned that he came to uh, the wall. Uh, unlike some of the other people, he was actually prepared to go there. So he got himself a really darn good uh gambeson to wear and he's managed to make it survive several seasons so <laughs> oh he did actually when he was in old stone last season he did have something else so so he's now currently competing with jora mormont as to who's got the the fewest costume changes in game yes. of thrones yeah but uh, um go ahead sorry no i was just going to say is, are there any other of these costumes that you'd particularly want to draw to our attention Sure. So there were a few people who commented about Varys and Tyrion. And what I was going to say about them, there's Varys. He's basically, this is a Pentoshi style cloak. So I call it a surcoat, which is sort of a medieval style cloak that you usually wear as an overgarment. Uh, Peter Baelish wears them and Tyrion wears them when they're in, in Pentos. Pentos. And uh, this one is like he, you, you probably remember he was wearing them. And what it, how it works is you belt the front goes over like a cape you belt the front and then the back part hangs down and it's pleated at the shoulders and of course we've got the uh you know the fur lining which is fur side in and i was saying that michelle clapton she tends to do that just to um so that the warmth is on the inside uh we see that in inuit cultures uh northern like the sami people cultures we tend to see that and then he is wearing a different tunic underneath it's got that same sort of style collar uh, the Targaryen style collar and it was funny because last season I noticed that he had this sort of mermaid scale and the people were like mermaid confirmed I guess that's a book thing right so he does once <laughs> again have the mermaid scale I, I, I think it's scale. a tinfoil thing actually but, it's a tinfoil uh, we'll... thing yeah, yeah so it's he definitely does... a tinfoil thing yeah 
so we just have that and uh, so uh, I've, to me this is saying that he's loyal to Danny this is what this is saying and that you know you're saying the colors he does have a little bit of blue in there as does Tyrion uh, I'm not a hundred percent about that I'm gonna have to mull on it there was at one point when they were in marine Danny was wearing a lot of blue and the blue was sort of a, a sort of a tribute to Khal Drogo so it could be that's a carryover in my mind I was thinking that it was Danny who's actually wardrobing her 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 team. So I think she's probably wardrobing Varys and she's wardrobing Tyrion. Someone had asked me if it was a dickie that Tyrion's wearing. It's actually a jerkin, which is like a vest, a medieval vest. He's worn them throughout the entire season, the entire series, always, always. So it's a vest with you know contrasting sleeves, and then he also has the surcoat uh, over top. Um, he wore it last season when he went to meet da uh, Jamie. He wore it when he uh, came out of the crate. They put him in, in the cape, if you remember that. He wore it for a few seasons and when Jorah abducted him. Now, the one thing I was going to mention, I have a video coming out about uh, symbolism in the costumes. The thing that was the most striking to me out of all the pictures is that Tyrion has this sort of zigzag, you know, herringbone style pattern on his coat. And... For me, I've been doing a little bit of research. So the zigzag, or it's like a chevron, inverted chevron pattern. So a chevron can represent being um, a warrior, and then, or the masculine, and then a, an inverted chevron can represent the negotiator, which Tyrion last season was wearing an inverted chevron. So I always thought of him as being the negotiator. And Danny was wearing zigzags, so she was kind of in conflict between being a negotiator and being a warrior, as we probably saw. So this season, he's not wearing the chevron, he's wearing zigzags. So to me, this is saying that he is probably in this season going to be both the negotiator and the warrior. Maybe like he's tired of, you know, having failed battles or something. I, um, that's the take I'm getting from it. And then, of course, he's wearing the... Uh, the hand of the queen yeah okay uh that is fantastic jr is there anything else you want to add on any of these uh, pictures before we move on with the Tyrion one i, I like his uh his jerkin uh just because it yeah. reminds me of scale it looks like yeah. dragon scale and i i absolutely love the the textures that she's using in this it's very striking and uh, very symbolic like you're talking about and i can't wait to see that episode on your channel heidi oh thanks yeah actually that's a really great point about the dragon scale yeah and one of the things uh and a lot of people i think this is what people love about michelle clapton is she is so great at combining textures so i would say that this is probably my favorite of all the looks um and then maybe danny's gray black one that is also uh her new one is probably another one because it reminds me of there's this italian dessert that you have all these like layers and layers and layers like you have cake and cream cake and cream a, a it kind of reminds me of that like a tiramisu so you've got all these little thin layers so it kind of reminds me of that so when i look at her she looks like a delicious uh targaryen dessert <laughs> uh, <laughs> and, and on that note um uh, Guys, I'm sure you, uh, you by now, if you hadn't ever come across uh, Heidi's work at, at Costume CA, you realize why I invited her on for this. There's, there's so much detail there that we can uh, easily miss or we can make some false assumptions about, about different costumes. Uh, but the, the expertise there really helps us to understand what it is that we're looking at. Uh, my overall takeaway from that is that uh, these might just be uh, promotional pictures, so we shouldn't take too much uh, from them. But most of the characters have kept their costumes, but the overall look is a lot darker, it's a lot more serious, um, and uh, we're getting some characters starting to show where their loyalties are. Varys is trying to show that he's loyal to Daenerys, or oh, where they're wanting to show their loyalty. So Varys is trying to show his loyalty to, uh, to Daenerys. Jaime is trying to show that he's no longer loyal to Cersei. And, and Danny is trying to show that she is at heart still a Targaryen, even if she's up north. So I think mm -hmm. those are the kind of the big takeaway points for me. Um, guys in the chat, uh, please do show your appreciation uh, for Heidi. But Heidi, do you want to uh, just let people know where they can find you uh, on the internet? 
Sure. Well, probably the best place is if you want to hit me up for questions or just chat. I love chatting. Twitter is the best place. I'm uh, uh, at Costume Cinemato is my handle. I also have a YouTube channel and uh, it's Costume Co. And I want to thank you so much, Robert, for having me. Anytime you want to have me on and talk about costumes, I would be delighted. Excellent. And guys, I would highly recommend you do go and check out Costume CO. Uh, the link, as I say, is down in the description. If you enjoy getting under, I was going to say getting underneath costumes, that's probably a, a poor choice of words. Uh, <laughs> if, you, if you enjoy getting into the detail of how costumes are made and what they represent, not just in Game of Thrones, but I know Heidi covers a lot of other stuff. We've talked about Westworld before uh, on this channel, but also a huge range of other shows. Please do go and check out her channel. Uh, so Heidi, thank you so much. Uh, Jay and our, Jay and I will carry on talking uh, about Cersei, but we'll definitely have you back on the channel at some point. Thanks, guys. Soon. I'll be it. I'll be in the chat for a bit too if you want to talk. Um, and Dara, it was really nice meeting you. I'll find you on Twitter. Nice meeting you too, Heidi. Yeah. Okay. Thanks so much, Robert. Take care. Bye now. Excellent. And guys, if there are any other questions you've got for Heidi, as as she said, she's uh, she's going to be down there in the in the chat so uh, please do go and uh, ask her any questions uh, but JR we are here as advertised we're here to talk about Cersei um, and we're, we're doing a sort of a character study we've had uh, a couple of super chats that we've just sort of uh, put to one side while we're talking about the costumes and also a whole load of questions uh, over on uh, Patreon um, uh, let's start um, shall we with um, a question that I I, I know we were both sort of thinking about beforehand. This was one from uh, Anime Lover, from Nicole, uh, saying, what's going on with Cersei? Uh, and this is about her overall psychological makeup. So she can't be a sociopath, says the question, because she loves her children, right? So does she love her children? Uh, is she narcissistic? Um, is there something else going wrong uh, with her sort of psychologically? What What's your take on the overall kind of like psychological makeup of Cersei. All right, so every time that we seem to delve into these conversations when it comes to mental illness, I, I make a couple of uh, caveats here. One, please remember that we are talking about characters in a fantasy novel, not real people. Two is have some res respect and decorum because these are serious illnesses that many people suffer from. Uh, and we'll try to get on with it as best as we can. And I'm going to be referencing uh, DSM-5. For those of you who don't know what that is, it's the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. Uh, it's basically the tool that practitioners use to diagnose mental illness and disorders in individuals in real life. So this is what I'm using to base this off of. This comes from uh, the work that I do with veterans specifically uh, with PTSD and other associated combat traumas. Uh, this is something that I, I work with on a daily basis. So this is where I'm pulling this information from, if that makes sense. Um, the, the biggest one that's, so Cersei Lannister, she's a whole ball of mess is what she is. Um, with that said though, you can still be uh, narcissistic and love your children. You don't have to, they're not mutually exclusive. So in my estimation, she is probably the most apt for um, narcissistic, narcissistic personality disorder. Now inside of narcissistic personality disorder, inside of DSM-5, they also have to fall into another subset of categories, which is three. And those threes that, the three categories that they have to fall into are antisocial personal personality disorder, borderline personality disorder, or histronic personality disorder. And those are kind of the overarching um, illnesses that are, that are there that also include in narcissistic personality disorder. And she certainly displays a great deal of both. So my estimation is that she would suffer from a borderline personality disorder and uh, certainly a narcissistic personality disorder. Yeah, so I, th I think that's a really interesting uh, sort of diagnosis as, as it were. I, th I think the other thing we'd probably say is that, that JR obviously has some expertise in this. I'm no, not an expert in the slightest on it, uh, but these are obviously very serious issues. If you're talking about real world characters, what we're talking about here are, 
um, fictional characters. This does tie in with a question we've got from uh, Benjamin Johnson. This was a super chat from earlier asking about any thoughts uh, on a thematic comparison between the myth or tragedy of Narcissus and Circe. Could the myth give any clues to Circe's endgame? Now, you you were talking about uh, whether she was narcissistic a moment ago. I think for me, uh, my reflection on that is that, although I've not read the, the myth of Narcissus for a while, the idea there was that this character, and this is obviously where we get narcissistic uh, tendencies and all the rest of it, that's where the, the, the root of it right, is. Right, that, that's exactly where it comes from. Exactly. So, um, but, but that character was exceptionally beautiful and became so um and and everyone loved uh, narcissus and but the 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 key was that narcissus finally saw his own reflection in a pool and fell in love with himself and became entranced with himself and this is where we get this idea of narcissism just being in love with who you are and that was narcissus in the myth that was narcissus's uh um, undoing really there are various different endings to it but none of them are good I think the one I like the most is that he turned into a flower um, uh, but did you have anything on that that you'd want to sort of uh, weigh in on JR in terms yeah, of that, that's absolutely where it, where it comes from is the the Greek tragedy of uh, nar uh, narcissus uh, yeah stares himself in a pool falls in love with himself and ultimately never leaves the pool just chooses to stare at himself for eternity or until he dies, I suppose, as it were. Uh, yeah, that's exactly where it comes from. Uh, thank you to the Greeks for giving us all these great disorders. Indeed. Uh, so, and sort of linking uh, from that, um, Karuna Timkova uh, over on Patreon was saying, um, one of Cersei's defining features was her righteous anger that she felt about the world not being as she wished which I think is a really important, this is sort of building on the idea of what, what are her kind of psychological building blocks. And there clearly is this idea from very young age that she felt that she was the one equipped to be like a ruler uh, and Jamie was the one who was equipped to be a fighter, uh, but she could not rule because she was a woman uh, and she felt quite embittered by this. Um, now, does this, so the, the, sort of the question goes on, uh, does this uh, get misinterpreted as some kind of um, making her mad uh, because she actually has got this kind of righteous anger? Are we, um, are, are we actually say, seeing a damaged, a woman who's been damaged by the world, by the system, by her father, by lots of other things, and actually just glibly saying that she's mad or narcissistic or something like that. What, what, what do you think on that one, JR? Uh, it certainly fits, fits right in with uh, narcissistic personality disorder. This, this grandiose sense of self-importance um, coupled with a, a preoccupation of fantasy, of power, brilliance, beauty, love, whatever it is, it, it fits right part and parcel into her character and the way she often thinks of herself especially in the book, she refers to herself as, as time went without a cock, honestly. The, the, she repeats it many times throughout the text. She does. And, and I think if I would just sort of add in on this is that I don't think George R. R. Martin is a very kind of black and white writer. I think that he tries to see the, the, the kind of the layers of a personality. And so we shouldn't try and say that there's a difference between somebody who's got some kind of psychological problems and somebody who's been abused by the world in some way. I think that he would see these things as interconnected. They may well have contributed to who she is, uh, but we shouldn't use that as a way to just excuse her for the, the morality or lack of morality of her actions. I think that we need to hold her to account for what she does without uh, losing sight of why she might do them, if that if that makes uh, sense. Um, uh, ja Jacqueline or Jacelyn uh, Ziegler, thank you so much for your super chat, um, uh, asking about Sansa and uh, I think this must be Robert Baratheon. Why is Sansa the only one who sees Robert's abuse? Um, I'm not sure that she is personally. I think that a lot of people recognise uh, that, Ro that Robert Baratheon was quite a, um, 
uh, I'd say strong character is probably missing the point here, but he, uh, he, he was indeed a drunkard and he was, again, one of these people who was a damaged person by what the system did to him. That doesn't excuse what he did, but I think a lot of people recognised what he was, and I think Cersei also recognised the damage that he was, but she tried to play it. I think the difference is that Sansa didn't necessarily try to play Robert Baratheon. This was quite early days in Sansa's development as a character. Cersei definitely did try to play him. Once she realised that he wasn't this um, wonderful knight in shining, shining armour kind of king, I think that she was trying to use him in a way to get what she was wanting. Which is Cersei's yeah, I mean, realization of it, right? And it, it's it's much of Sansa's story arc too, when she gets to uh, King's Landing, realizing the fallacy of the knight in shining armor and fairy tale happily ever after, right? Cersei went through it herself uh, when she had to marry Robert Baratheon. She did, yeah. So, so Cersei still had these quite, for for quite a long time these. These are ideas of what a knight should be, the true knight. She talks about uh, two or three times, she talks about what the true knight is. Uh, and that's a, a phrase that we hear a few times across um, the, sort of the world of Ice and Fire. Brienne, it's used of, uh, also Duncan Egg novels, it comes up quite a lot uh, when Dunk is, is thinking about what Sir Arlen of Penetry uh, used to be talking about. And also, this is going off complete tangent, but I noticed on a recent reread in, in each of the three Duncan Egg novels, uh, there is a point in each of those novels where somebody tells Dunk that he is a true knight. Um, and and this is uh, this is very clear that it's just it's not just like one person who thinks it's in every single time he, something happens, somebody reflects that he is a true knight, even if he may not be actually technically a knight, but I did a video on that one. As I say, that's a, a bit of a digression. Shall we dig into this whole idea? A lot of people have asked the questions around uh, the idea of whether Cersei is actually who she thinks she is. Uh, there's a for those who don't know it. There's there's this uh, theory uh, that it's not a tinfoil theory. I would say that there is some evidence to back this up uh, that she might and Jamie. Uh, might be Targaryens. Now, the um, uh, JR, I'll come to you in a moment on this one for your thoughts, because I'm sure you've heard the theory before. But for those who haven't, the, the thought is that there are some elements to Cersei's character that are quite reflective of the Mad King, Aerys II. Uh, for example, the fact that she loves wildfire and blowing things up. Also, the fact that she has an incestuous relationship with her brother which is a very much a Targaryen thing. Obviously, uh, Aerys II was married to his sister. So, so there are kind of echoes going on there. Added to which, it seems very clear that, uh, that Aerys and um, uh, Tywin Lannister were close and Aerys had a bit of a thing about Joanna, Tywin's wife. And uh, it's made very clear that there was uh, more than one occasion when uh, Aerys sort of pushed his luck, shall we say, and and we don't know quite what happened from that, uh, but the the hints are probably more than uh, we would think is is morally acceptable. But this leaves open the possibility that one or more of the Lannisters might actually secretly be a Targaryen. Um, John Lamb was asking this very question over on Patreon, um, uh, so. Uh, this, uh, do you think that this explains a lot of Cersei's character, or do you think they are that this is just a complete red herring? I, I want to believe it. I like it just because it gives that much more punch to the fact that Tyrion is Tywin's only true born son, and therefore actually the rightful heir to. Castle Rock and and all the titles and lands that go with it. That's the part about it that I love. Do I th think it's really? It's certainly possible. Joanna and uh, Aries Aries was actually quite attractive before he went mad. Uh, it's certainly not out of the realm of possibilities. Um, first night there was made mention of that uh, at Joanna and Tywin's wedding. First night rules with Matt, uh, with Aris. Uh, there's certainly references for it. It has contextual evidence. 
I like it uh, mostly for Tyrion, but that's about as far as I go with it. Yeah, so I, I I find myself actually sort of swinging both ways on this one. In, uh, right, it's funny with this like, one because like everybody kind of does that, I think. <laughs> it's like, I really like it, but I don't. Yeah, so I think on Tyrion, we can leave to one side. I, I, I've, I've not come full 360 on Tyrion, but I'm, I'm starting to... Uh, to to move my position there, Jamie. For me, there's nothing about Jamie that says that he is anything but a Lannister. He seems very Lannistery all the way through. Um, the 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 only things about Cersei that seem to work for it are these kind of echoes of her being the Mad Queen, as it were. Um, that she seems quite like Eris, but uh, f- for me, I I don't know. It just seems more likely that she is just uh, a Lannister. Certainly Tywin didn't seem to have any doubts about them in the way that he seems to have doubts about Tyrion uh, when he's saying, you know, I can't prove that you're not mine. That seems to imply that he thought he probably wasn't, but he couldn't prove it. He never, even for one second, even though he clearly doesn't rate Cersei in any way, shape or form, he never seems to doubt that she is his daughter um so i i think i i tend to the view that no they're they're lannisters and that's just the the, the way it is i i do like the irony that perhaps Tyrion is a true lannister and they're not and actually tywin got it wrong all the time and the the, the child that he was he sort of effectively kicking out is the only one that is actually his child but i honestly can't see jamie not being a lannister um, Cersei seems quite Lannistry, and uh, my fundamental thought is I don't think we're ever going to find out. I think this is just one of those things that is left hanging as a possibility in the air. I don't think it's something that suddenly someone's going to go, oh yeah, so I was uh, I was outside the bedchamber and I discovered this, and, and that's not going to happen. We're not going to suddenly find. Yeah, their, there's their there's not going to be an aha character here. There, there's no sleuthing or de- detective good enough to find this one out. I, I think it's kind of, and it's because of that that I think it's a red herring mostly. Uh, Karen Richmond just aptly pointed out though that they are fraternal twins, so they could be of two different fathers. It is possible. It uh, is. It is possible. It, yeah. it is possible. Uh, a little bit out there uh, and a lot of tinfoil. It, it is possible. Yeah, I, I mean, I would agree with that. Uh, John St. Baptiste, hi there, by the way, John. Uh, if you've not come across John St. Baptiste, he's got a fantastic channel over here uh, on YouTube uh, looking at music. So if you're a music fan, please do go and check that out. I'm sure one of the, the moderators, at which point I should say, thank you so much, moderators. Uh, uh, you do a wonderful job. I'm sure one of the moderators will drop a link in the, uh, the live chat. Uh, but John St. Baptiste says uh, there are different lineage theories involving Cersei and Jamie. Um, how much of their behavior is nature versus nurture. So I think we sort of covered off that one. Um, then he says, uh, Danny and Cersei have quite a bit in common. Would you agree with that, JR? Uh, they do and they don't. Uh, Danny certainly has tendencies that would push her over the edge to mad queen status, but she pulls back from them. And this is pretty much in the show because we're not there in the books yet. Uh, in dealing with King's Landing, as John points out to her, like, you haven't taken it yet. Why? That means at least at some level, you're better than Cersei. Uh, uh, and it's true. She's not going to go take it with fire and blood. She she can't afford to. Uh, the common folk will hate her, and they don't care about Targaryens, to, in spite of all the uh, sort of bravado and lies that she's been fed all this time that, she, that Viserys uh, fell victim to, right? Uh, the thought of, you know, all the common people, uh, you know, have secret toast to your uh, Targaryen heritage. that They don't care. Uh, as Jorah pointed out that, you know, they only care about a, a short winter and a good crop, uh, which is very true. And so she doesn't give herself those moments uh, of f- flash pan moments where she's going to burn something to the ground. She stops herself. Yeah, she does. And I think that the... Um, uh, the, the, the differences are clearly there, but there are some similarities that we do have to recognize. And the love of fire, um, 
where I would kind of draw the line is the fact that whereas Danny has this kind of innate in love of fire, love of heat, love of warmth and all the rest of it, that seems to be just a part of her Targaryen heritage and so her first thoughts. Uh, we saw it on the show, you know, Tyrion always seems to be trying to pull her back from just like going and firebombing King's Landing because that's her default reaction. It's how she executes people with, is with dragon fire. That's just a part of who she is, very much a nature thing. With Cersei, I've always viewed her relationship to fire as just quite pragmatic. It's just the way, if there were another way of killing all the people that she wants dead, then she would use that. It's just this happens to be the thing that's there, so she will use it. So I think that there is a slight difference in approach between the two of them. Um, the, the bit that... I I find quite fascinating is this idea of like the the Mad King's daughter. It's something in the books Danny comes back to a few times, questioning herself: Is she her father's daughter? Because a lot of people sort of mention this to her about you know your your father was the Mad King, and she just like, am I am I like that? That incidentally, I I always view that as quite a positive thing for Danny to actually be questioning this rather than just going down a route. She's actually questioning. Am I like that? Do I want to be like that? That seems quite a mature uh, uh, it's, approach. It's, it's very much that, that Westworld tie-in, right? Are, do, have you ever questioned your own reality? Yeah, the nature right? of your yeah. own reality, exactly. Yeah, it, it, it always made me laugh. Every time that she does it, the books after seeing Westworld, I was like, huh, that's kind of funny. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, she, did, she does question. And, and part of this theory also stems from the Red Door. Uh, where was it actually at? How much does she actually know about her own being? Uh, and she does question it quite a bit, so it, it kind of goes hand in hand with it. She she does. I, I am having done a couple of recent videos on the subject. I am one hundred percent convinced the Red Door is indeed in Bravos. I don't think that there's any made up stuff there. I think that that's just um, uh, a lot of uh, the, the uh, piece. The piece that always hangs me up is the the fruit tree, the lemon tree. That yeah. you can't grow a lemon tree in Dorne without a glass house, like Winterfell's, uh, you know, gardens under glass. Well, so uh, for me, there, there's a line here that everyone always seems to quote, which is that um, lemon trees do not grow in Bravos. But everyone always misses the second half of the line, which is, uh, except for in the gardens and the courts of the rich and mighty. Um, and that, for me, is the critical point, because she was in the courts and the gardens of the rich and the mighty. Oh, absolutely she was, correct. She was so, held in very high regard. She was. And we know that the Targaryens were there. Uh, the Sea Lord witnessed a marriage pact between Viserys um, uh, and the Martells, and Arian Martell. Uh, that seems to be where they were. There is a sort of a semi-official account that uh, the Oberyn even brought over uh, lemon lemon tree seeds for the um, uh, the Sea Lord. So uh, I, th there there can be with the lemon trees growing there if you're rich enough you can do it it's not a it's not a problem they can get right and then they'd be under them. glass they'd be under glass like they are at winterfell uh their courtyard would be covered in glass somehow exactly you can do that very easily it's it's uh it's entirely doable they've got this huge uh, sort of canal system as well with this this freshwater canal that goes all the way through bravos and it stops just outside the Sea Lord's Palace and it goes and, and provides fresh water there. So even the briny water is not an issue. Um, you can have walled gardens to prevent the sea breezes. It's entirely possible to have uh, citrus fruit growing just in very small places within Bravos. So, so that's the... Uh, that's my take on it, uh, and the moment that you get this, we're going slightly away from Cersei here, but oh, I'm going a little off bit, not much. We're okay. Uh, uh, <laughs> but uh, the um, uh, the the moment you accept the fact that fruit trees can grow in Bravos, that takes away the only um, argument against it that that I can personally see, and I see, and there are plenty of reasons why it almost certainly is Bravos because we, we can place them there with the marriage pact. Uh, there is a very good reason why 
in my next video, in fact, that will be coming on to that I'll talk about in just a second. Uh, there's always, a very good always spoiling your next Bravo video. Involved. It's a tradition. Uh, it is a tradition. I, uh, so <laughs> I, I, I will do that. Well, uh, let, let me spoil it for you now. My next, my <laughs> next big video is going to be about those three dragon eggs. If you've read Fire and Blood, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. Those three dragon eggs that Danny ends up with, that. Uh, pretty much everyone's picked up on the idea these were the ones that Alyssa Farman took with her up and sold to the Sea Lord of Bravos. And what I'm wanting to do is explore this idea, not just to draw, try and draw up that link, which I think is pretty obvious, but also to say, well, what does that mean? And I think what that means is that Bravos is actually a whole lot more central than we think, because they have got these three dragon eggs that then go to Danny. They will have obviously known that they were going to be going to Danny because they're not stupid. Uh, they, the Sea Lord witnessed the marriage pact between Dawn and the Targaryens. Actually, Bravos is not just this kind of neutral city that we thought it was. Actually, it's the center of what looks like it might be a massive political kind of... Um, They're uh, very active in the game. Exactly. And they kind of touched on it in the show, but it, it's much more prevalent in the books. Uh, how much of a game player and big time game player that they are, uh, who they yeah. back with money, who they choose to support and aid. Uh, there's a lot of things that goes on with it, which does beg the question. Uh, what kind of red wines do they have in Bravos? And have you visited there? I've obviously been to Bravos quite a lot. Um, uh, so um, in red wine, sorry, in my, if you're talking about my traveler's guide, we will be there in about two months time, I predict. They ah, they import okay. their wine. Uh, this they is do. what so they do not have vines in Bravos, but they import it from, uh, from around the world. So I, I humbly predict that there will be an, uh, a rather cheeky Dornish red in there somewhere. Um, Fantastic. I wasn't sure because I was thinking, I wasn't sure if you have a traveler's guide to Bravos yet. I was th I'm like going back through the catalog of uh, videos in my head and I'm going, I don't think there is one. Not yet. So, so uh, as we've reached that point, I often like take a break actually halfway through and, and JR, thank you for the uh, uh, probably unintentional lead into this. Uh, I'm, I'm going to go to uh, things that are coming up on my channel. Uh, the Traveler's Guide has reached the bottom of Westeros. So the one that's coming out tomorrow is going to be the last one on the Westerosi mainland. We've just got a little bit to finish off with the water gardens in Dawn. And then we're going to be moving up uh, going to look at the step so stones, move up through the narrow sea, all the way up, looking at Tarth, Dragonstone. I'm sure we'll be at Dragonstone for a bit. And then we're going to end up uh, over in Essos, and the Traveler's Guide is going to move through Essos. So that's what's going to be happening next with the Traveler's Guide. I've already spoiled my next big video, which I'm hoping will come out over the weekend, which is going to be about those dragon eggs. The other two things I would mention, uh, my second channel, if you don't know it, The Well-Told Tale, where I read, effectively I read audiobooks, what I consider to be the finest science fiction and fantasy stories ever written. Um, we're currently halfway through The Call of Cthulhu by H.P. Lovecraft, which is an amazing story. Uh, and it's got so many links across to A Song of Ice and Fire that you will uh, immediately pick up on when you when you listen to it so if you're interested in that please do go and check that out and patrons uh thank you i say it every week but i cannot do what i do without your support um uh, for those who don't know patreon there are a number of different uh, levels of support there if you want access to my audio material every bit of audio stuff i do is available for five dollars a month but there are other benefits for for higher at ten dollars you get a chance to influence what i do what i create on this channel what videos i do and there is at the moment for ten dollar patrons uh, there's a chance to vote on the series that i do next so i'm going to do a mini series with Gemma from Secrets of the Citadel. Uh, so there's a little chance there to vote on what subjects we're gonna be covering it over the course of five or six videos. So uh, if you're interested in that, please go and check out patreon.com slash IndeepGeek. There is a link down in the description. But JR, I've got you on because um, I don't know, you're very active within the community. So I suspect a lot of people know you. I don't know how many people will know Geek Chat One because on YouTube, it's quite a new channel. Uh, but it's also very active over on Facebook. Do you want to just give us the quick plug? Uh, what is Geek Chat One? Uh, 
Geek Chat One started in the wake of post-con blues after Con of Thrones last year. And I just noticed a, a gap between content creators and, uh, you know, people they collaborate with and fans and a place to be able to kind of interact with all of it. I know that a lot of people um, don't necessarily want to share their personal Facebooks because that is their personal life, uh, you know, uh, separate from their on-screen persona or what have you. But it was a safe place for them to gather and talk and and hang out and, you know, just talk about all the things that we love. And it doesn't matter what fandom you hail from. It mostly started with the Song of Ice and Fire, obviously, uh, coming after Con of Thrones. Uh, but we we love all sorts of fandoms there, and it's a place to talk and geek out. Uh, we don't do real world politics; uh, it's not allowed. Uh, it's just a great community that started. And you know, I, I often call myself the Tyler Durden of uh, Geek Chat One. You know, I just gave it a name, right? It was on the tips of everybody's tongue, but I just happened to give it a name. Yeah, and uh, I, th I think JR is is incredibly humble here. He is the driving force behind it. There are many people who make up uh, Geek Chat One who do fantastic things, but uh, uh, the driving force behind it is JR. So, uh, guys, I would you know I only invite people on here that I, I personally rate their channels. Geek Chat One on YouTube is quite a small channel. I think when I checked it, I think there are only something like four, maybe five videos on there. But the people who are involved in it are great people who are going to be producing really good content. So I would like to encourage you. The link is down in the description. Please do go over there and subscribe. Keep an eye out for new videos uh, and, and just get involved in that. Also, the Facebook group uh, is a, as JR said, it's a fantastic group of people. I I, uh, I check it most days. I'm, I'm in there and I'm actively involved in it, as are a number of other creators that I'm sure you all know, people like Gemma from Seed with uh, JR, um, uh, Azora Hype is in there as well. So there's, there's a lot of good people uh, who just uh, hang out in that Facebook group. So I would highly there, recommend There is, and, and I have podcasts with almost all of them that hang out in there, which is kind of funny to me. So we have... Uh, most likely Cantina Buzz, which is with Helen making mortar or gin or whatever it is this week. Great again, who was in the chats earlier, who went to bed as she's on uh, Central European time. So it's way past midnight there. Uh, Gemma and I have Snapchats where we discuss everything Marvel and what's going on in the world of comic books. Uh, Kyle and I are rebranding our uh, Iron or Bronze and Iron podcast. We're going to reform that into an expanse podcast. So be uh, looking forward to that one. It'll be a lot of fun. Uh, yeah. And then I do a uh, geek review with news with Lauren Cullen. And we talk about any geeky news that came out during the week. And those are kind of the main staples of the geek chat one channel. Excellent. Please do go and check that out, guys. We had a couple of super chats I want to pick up on. Ellen King. Thank you so much. Five dollars. Just saying just thanks, which is uh, incredibly kind. Uh, and uh, had another one from uh, Linda Prasuta. Uh, I think it was $25, which is very generous, um, saying, no question, love your channel and content. Thank you, Linda. I really appreciate that. That's very kind. Um, uh, so let's just uh, go back to, uh, I think I missed one, actually. Uh, we had Marvin Martin, uh, $2, yes. uh, saying, uh, some think Cersei will molest Common, any thoughts? Now, I don't know whether this is a show or book question because obviously there's a difference there on the show. Uh, Tommen is no longer with us. Rest in peace. Uh, <laughs> what, what, what would you say, JR, to this? Do you think there's there's anything? In, I don't know who these people are, but do, do you think there's anything in this? Uh, I, I don't think there's a lot to it. I, I think this one actually stems more from the books and um, Marjorie sneaking into his bedchambers and our introduction into Sir Pounce and all of all of that stuff because he is quite young in the books and marjorie is 14 15 whereas tommen in the books is like eight or nine so there is quite an age gap between the two and they sort of have this courting relationship going on uh when tommen it first comes into his uh reign i i think that's probably where it's stemming from and seeing the way to get power over the king is manipulation like marjorie's doing usually um affection and, and sexual proclivity, whatever you want to call it. I think that's where people are trying to go with it with Cersei. I don't really see it as being a thing in the book. I don't think it'll come about. 
No, I think I'd agree with that. I think that um, that's just a bit of a guessing game too much for me. Certainly on the show now, um, uh, even if Kyburn brings Tommen back, which is possible, um, but in the <laughs> books, I can't see that that's likely. I wanted to keep, pick up on just a couple of very quick things I saw in the chat just as I was flicking through. Uh, Igreet Weirwood um, asking whether Sir Willem Darry's Sea Lord who is the sea lord who witnessed that marriage pact I was talking about a moment ago when Danny was uh, a young child under five. Um, is that the same sea lord as in the current day or is it a different one? Now, this is a, a fantastic question. I know we're getting away from Cersei, but this is a bit of a pet topic of mine at the moment, so I'm going to go with it. Um, the sea lord is elected within Brabos to serve for life, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the, every sea lord dies of old age. Um, uh, that it's quite a, um, uh, a violent politi political world in Bravos. The implication is that there has been a change of sea lord quite recently because uh, we had um, um, Dario Nahar, or Dario, um, Sirio Farrell. Farrell. Get, 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 getting all my names mixed up here. So Sirio was. Um, effectively bodyguard, being the, the, the first sword of Bravos, effectively bodyguard to the, the Sea Lord, and, and then he had to leave Bravos completely, which seems to imply that there's a change of Sea Lord, it seems to imply it was relatively recent before the start of the show, uh, so yes, it seems to imply that there was a change of Sea Lord between then and now, and the rumours that Arya hears in the books when she's just like going around doing a little bit of eavesdropping um, are that there's going to be another change quite soon. Uh, so it probably wasn't the same Sea Lord uh, and therefore we have to not think of Bravos as necessarily having a consistent foreign policy, which sounds really quite dull, but when you're actually thinking in terms of what they are about and what they're going to try and achieve, how they're going to try and achieve that, that will change subtly over time as a city. The same principles will, will be there to protect the city, to help, help it stay rich, protect trade and all, all the rest of it. Um, uh, but exactly how they go about doing that um, uh, might change depending on who the uh, Sea Lord is. Um, JR, did you, I think you just uh, spotted a good question about Cersei's narcissism uh, that you were going to pick up on. Was this Marvin uh, yeah, Martin with, again? Yeah, with a two dollar uh, super oh, chat. Oh, yeah. Sorry, I, I missed that one completely. So yeah, so Marvin. Uh, no, Martin, it just popped in for the uh, for the, uh, the super chat uh, saying what started Cersei's narcissism. Um, is is this a thing that could get started if we're taking it seriously as a psychological issue? Does does something spark it, or is it just an innate thing? In, in a it, it, it's kind of an, an innate thing from my understanding of it. It, it it's just sort of there this isn't a, a nature versus nurture kind of deal it, it's inherently there uh it can manifest many different ways at a young age uh but full-blown uh narcissism uh as a personality disorder uh is really diagnosable between i think it's like between 14 to 18 is really when they try to diagnose it uh so they can curtail some of it um or, or not have it go full blown. Uh, that's my takeaway from it. Yeah, I, I think I would. I, well, I certainly wouldn't disagree with that. Um, I will bow to your superior knowledge of of, of how that how that actually works. Um, I just wanted to pick up on John Saint Baptiste, the second part of your question, which um, I sort of uh, got distracted before I got to, uh, which was this linking between Danny and Cersei, um, asking, uh, saying that I know that there are point of view chapters throughout A Song of Ice and Fire, but in a way that also are in face in fire and blood. Are the narratives being told from a third party bias? Uh, is A Song of Ice and Fire in the end just more Targaryen propaganda? Um, my take on this is, and actually over on Twitter, there was a, I don't know whether she's in the chat bar, the Bard uh, came out with a fantastic um, bit of analysis about two different types of history being recorded within Westeros, the formal history being done by the maesters and the kind of the 
the, the experiential history, which is through the weirwood trees and remembering history. Um, and my take on that, or my twist on that, is that this is the two different ways that George R. R. Martin has used to show us what's happening. The formal way, which is quite a curated way, an edited way, which is what the maesters are doing, that is what we see in Fire and Blood and the World of Ice and Fire. Those things are told from a bias, a bias of the person who is collating, editing the information. That is quite often, well, in Fire and Blood, that is very clearly a Targaryen bias. When you're looking in the world of Ice and Fire, that's very clearly a, the golden age of Robert Baratheon bias. So there are different biases going on there. The, the other type, the more experiential type, being the, the what we get in A Song of Ice and Fire, and the Duncan Egg stories, they are written from different people's perspectives. I do not think that they are being edited uh, within this world. I don't think they're being edited by someone. It, they, you could interpret them as being effectively like bits from the Weirwoods experience, but I, I personally wouldn't quite go that far. I think that the short answer to your question is no, I do not think that George R. R. Martin is intending to write A Song of Ice and Fire as somebody's overall perspective, I think he's intentionally writing it from lots of different perspectives. Uh, JR, did you have a thought on that uh, uh, in terms of how it's yeah, I, I'm, I'm with you on that. I, I think uh, A Song of Ice and Fire itself is being told from many different perspectives. I think it's a, a fun way to play with different uh, point narratives as a writer. Uh, you know, whether you're being a maester that's recording history that has the Targaryen bias in it, right? Uh, as we have with uh, Fire and Blood or even uh, History, a little bit plays with that as well. Uh, my personal thing with the Dunkin' Egg, I like to think of those as uh, oral tradition that's finally been translated to uh, written word. So I, I like to think of those stories, and I don't know why, it just always tickles me that uh, to think that they came from an oral tradition when writing was obviously a thing during that time. But... You know, those, those sort of stories that common folk would tell themselves about this common hedge knight that was a boy from nothing in Flea Bottom that, you know, became the uh, leader of the King's Guard. Uh, how did he get there? How did that happen? And so it's kind of the story that's made up in between that. I, I think it's what the lower classes uh, inside of Westeros would tell their children when they go to sleep, right? Yeah, I think so. And I think I would add, I, I noticed Klaus Richter, uh, there. So, uh, uh, Klaus, just to, to say, I, I didn't uh, manage to pick up on your question on Patreon before going live, uh, but I did try and put it to um, to Heidi in the chat, so I hope she managed to answer that one for you. Uh, if not, I will pass it on to her afterwards. Uh, but the, what you just say here, the, the POV chapters are biased as well. Yes, they are. And for me, I think that is that is the whole point, that it's everybody's own perspective of what's going on, and we have to try and pick out the narrative based on our understanding of, of how much we can trust of the people whose point of view we're going through. Um, can I turn this to prophecy and Cersei now? Because I've got two or three I, questions. I was hoping we would. Yeah, so so um, I might just sort of say go in a moment to you, but but I've got... Uh, there are there are three bits to this I want to pick up on. First of all, James Sidney uh, was asking about um, the bit with Maggie the Frog's prophecy, where he's talking about uh, the other younger and more beautiful person. Uh, who might this actually be? Suggesting that this might be Brienne. Daisy Lancaster's talking about uh, the Valon Car. Um, uh, and uh, whether this might actually be Cersei taking her own life. Um, uh, then uh, Linda Prasuta is saying, do you think that her fear of prophecy has doomed her to be the monster to play out with her uh, fury and wrath? Uh, so has the prophecy actually shaped her? Um, where, where do you want to start with this, JR? Uh, the answer is yes. <laughs> I think she, I think she's uh, very much self-fulfilled this prophecy um, because she was told it. She's made it so right. Uh, we have those those constant things that come up with Cersei and Maggie the Frog being keen um, amongst all of them. I mean, Cersei's this massive character, but everybody always comes back to Maggie the Frog, which I always find really interesting. 
uh, George R. R. Martin loves to play with the tropes that are typically found in fantasy literature and in novels, and he likes to turn them on its head. And that also applies with the way he, he sardonically writes about some of them or ironically writes about them. And I think the more beautiful, the more uh, the more beautiful queen is Brienne. And that's because it falls into that George R. R. Martin turning it on its head, right? Brienne the beauty. It, it's the scoffing, sarcastic beauty, right? That everybody's dubbed her beautiful, uh, which she inherently feels ugly. Uh, but that's the one who's younger and more beautiful than her because it's the person that Jamie can actually truly relate to and understand on a deeper level that Cersei is not capable of with her pre-existing condition of being a narcissist. You can't have a narcissist that acknowledges somebody else in, in that way. And that's what Jamie has ultimately been searching for this whole time is somebody to acknowledge him on a level where he is just him. Right. And he, he says it. There are no men like me. There's just me. There's only me. And he needs somebody else that can pair him. And that is Brienne, in my opinion. Yeah, I like that. And I, I think that uh, just to take that specific part then of the Maggie the Frog prophecy, this idea of the, the younger, more beautiful person who's going to take away all that, that Cersei holds dear. I, I think that George R. R. Martin probably, as, as he does with most things, is working on a couple of different layers here. Uh, the first layer, I think, is Jamie. I think you're entirely right that this is Brienne, who's, who's not actually trying to take Jamie. We should probably be clear about this. It's not that Brienne's got this grand plan that she has to steal Jamie away from Cersei. It's just that Jamie sees something and is drawn to Brienne. So that's a slightly different take on it. Uh, then there's also the power, the Iron Throne. Uh, yes, I think this is the, we'll come to this in just a moment in another question. But yes, I think she will get to the Iron Throne in, in the books. And I think that, the, that she will get uh, overthrown by somebody younger or more beautiful than her. And I think Daenerys will certainly have a role in that. And I think that that is definitely there. Um, but I always come back to this idea. And if you spend any time on this channel you know that I say this lots. George R. R. Martin's main thing with prophecy is not the truth of the prophecy, it's how do people react to it. And this is the thing that he's wanting us to see is that it's what drives Cersei and for Cersei uh, in books the thing which drives her the most out of it actually is the Valonqar element. Who she thinks is going to be the Valonqar, this is what drives her a whole a uh, uh, problem with Tyrion is the idea that she's convinced it's him. On the show, they obviously didn't include the Valonqar uh, bit of that prophecy. Uh, and so they focused, actually, if you look at the arc of, I forget exactly which season it is, maybe season six uh, with Marjorie, when we start with the whole Maggie the Frog uh, sort of flashback, actually, if you look at her arc within that season, it is all about her trying to work out who this younger, more beautiful person is, deciding it's Marjorie, and then doing something incredibly dramatic about it. The action- right, She thought it was Sansa. She thought it was Marjorie. She exactly. Thinks, she's looking for the physical beauty in something or someone, and, and she's completely, well, in the show, they did it a little different. In the book, she's gonna be completely blindsided by the fact that it is Brienne. Brienne the beauty. Yeah. And, and so, so this is the thing, is that it's what drives her and the actions that she takes on the basis of her belief. And, and there will be some irony in the fact that she gets it very wrong, but in terms of the action, it's all based on the, what she believes rather than the truth or not of the prophecy. Um, as we're on the Valonqar, this seems to be a question which comes up all, all the time. Is there anything that you can uh, sort of add to to this? Uh, I, I, to the great who, who Valonqar you, debate? To the great Valonqar debate. Um, who, who do you think is the okay. Valonqar? Do you think it matters? Do, what, what's, what's your view on it all? You're going to have to, excuse me, Robert, give me a little bit of leeway on this because I'm going to circle back to make the ultimate point. And <laughs> okay, I, go will, for it. I will explain it. This, this was one of my favorite uh, tinfoil theories that I kind of came up with a long time ago. 
And the more that I thought about it, it, it started becoming less tinfoily as time went on and as the books kept releasing and where the shows progress now, uh, the Valencar. So this is, this also goes into George R. R. Martin playing with those tropes and, and fantasy and, and everything. And uh, what is or what is said is not necessarily what is meant. Um, how, how would a Valencar, which can be a uh, little brother or sister in High Valerian, because it has the ability to be gender neutral, how does this play in and, and what would happen? So this is what JR thinks is going to happen in the show. So shoot me first, not Robert. It's, it's not his uh, burden to bear on this one, as it were. Uh, Jamie, oh, man, where to start with this? Okay, so let's just go with this. Okay, Cersei is going to die of little brother. Now, to me, the most ironic thing would be that she would die from Jamie, right? Because she's always assumed that it's Tyrion. What happens if it's both? What if it is both Jamie and Tyrion that end up killing her? So this basically starts with the idea that Cersei is this great strategist in her head. She is Tywin with tits. And she can make all these brilliant moves, and she's made no brilliant moves, by the way. But in her head, all of her moves have been brilliant, including getting her brother put on the King's Guard to begin with, only to have that king not sit the throne. Anyway, uh, none of her plans have ever worked out right or well, and this is going to be a continuation of it. I think Cersei is bold enough to attempt opening a two-front war against the forces of the North while they're still fighting against the army of the undead. So ultimately, Danny and John are going to be sandwiched between the forces of King's Landing and the forces of the Night's King. What's going to happen is they're going to come to a place in Westeros where it is the most narrow, so Danny and John have the ability to use their numbers the most advantageous. Even on two fronts, there's one point in Westeros that they could successfully defend and counter uh, offenses from both sides, and that is the neck. So part of the Valakar prophecy is that wrapping the hands around the neck. Little brother will wrap hands around the neck. Well, the fiery hand is going to be there and be with Tyrion as the hand of the queen of Daenerys, which is one brother that would be on the right-hand side because Jamie has no right hand. He only has his left hand. Jamie is going to be leading forces of them on the left-hand side of the continent. So what happens at the neck when the war goes the opposite way and both hands meet in the middle with all of Cersei's forces sitting right there in the neck? Now she's become enveloped in warfare, which means the game is pretty much over for her. So that's Jair's crackpot theory that's becoming a little less tinfoily to me as I think about it and put other contextual evidence behind it. But it's that both of them will end up enveloping Cersei in the neck and working hand in hand with each other, which means both little brothers would actually be her undoing. Wow. I mean, I I, I love it when I hear a new theory I haven't heard before. The Valonqor is the... I. Probably out of all the, the areas of the Song of Ice and Fire, the one that I can almost guarantee everybody's got a slightly different idea on. This is the first time I've heard this one, guys, so let us know in the chat what you think of it. Um, I like the idea. I really do. I think that um, that requires Cersei, therefore, to have moved away from King's Landing up to the neck, which at the moment I can't see happening. I personally see her... Uh, having her last stand in King's Landing. That's my my personal take. Um, and I think that the thing about Moat Kaelin, which is like the, 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 the castle which guards the neck, is that it's only defendable from forces attacking from the south, not the north. That's the way that it's set up. It's set up to protect the north. Uh, so with those caveats, I would say that I do like the idea that it might be both. Um, uh, I, if I were to get into the language, this is, sounds like I'm trying to unpick it, but this is, this is me no, trying to work no, through no. my brain. This is, if I try, right. then I think the Valonqar seems to be singular uh, rather than plural, shall wrap his hands 
uh but uh yeah i don't know I, I think it's a really good idea guys in the chat i'd love to know what your thoughts are um uh, that i think personally for me i've always gone with jamie makes the most as you said uh, it makes the most poetic sense uh but the 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 more we think on that, the more likely perhaps it is that Tyrion does, because everybody discounts the idea that Tyrion might do it. Well, and, and I just love the irony and symbolism behind it that Tyrion will have, or Jamie will have the fiery hand with him, ultimately, you know, fulfilling both hands again, right? And that Tyrion will, as the hand of the, the queen, will be the other hand that ends up enveloping. And I really think the crux for this theory, and it's yet to be seen, is we dubbed it the other day on a, another channel talk. Actually it was yesterday. Uh, the golden company coming into play in this and what, what would they happen? What would happen to them to, to get them to turn against Cersei? Well, I think somewhere in the foundation or formative uh, bylaws of the golden company, it's written somewhere that you will always support a Targaryen claim, whether it's Targaryen or Blackfire, because that's how the golden company was established. Uh, I think that there is a, uh, a golden 66 order, so to speak. And there will come a point in the battle where they will turn against Cersei completely and start fighting for Danny and John against uh, the forces of the South. And so it's like the golden 66 order will get released at some point in the battle when the leaders of the golden company realize that it's a Targaryen they're fighting against. And that's against their own uh, bond or their own originating documents. Well, I mean, I think that this is that the show has has gone the very simple route of the Golden Company of just turning them obviously into just a, an army for hire, effectively. Right, uh, the, just another cell sword company. Yeah. So, so in in the books, their foundation was actually as part of the the Blackfire. This was they were the, what was left after from the first Blackfire Rebellion, uh, founded uh, by Bitter Steel there as a standing army to help the Blackfires take the throne off of the Targaryens. But it was founded by a Targaryen who was legitimized. He was a bastard, but he was legitimized. And that started the Blackfire house after the fact. But he it, went by the surname of Targaryen. Yes. Yeah, so so the, the, the complication, I think, in the books is that they are going to be very much on the side of um, uh, Aegon, Fagon, as well as, as Fagon, we just yeah. call him exactly. So, uh, so, so they are going to be fighting on that side to start with against Cersei. But then we get the issue of where they're going to end up because at some point he is going to come up against Danny as well. And actually, I think we've got a, this kind of like um, good old fashioned Targaryen succession crisis, which will probably end up in a three way war at, in the south while the dragon the has three heads. I mean, it kind of fills back into it, doesn't it? It it, def it definitely does. Um, and while we're talking about heads, this is the worst link I've ever done, so apologies. Uh, oh. Jack Hurst uh, with his uh, super chat saying, in the light of Jamie's new look and JR's immaculate facial hair, it is immaculate, it has to be said, uh, top three beards on the show. Obviously off topic, so don't mind if you come at it at the end, but um, uh, let's quickly do this one now. I, I think that the best beard has to be Davos. I've always been a fan of Tyrion's beard, um, and I'm struggling for a third good one, to be honest. I'm not a Tormund. big fan of John's. Oh, Torment. Torment. There we go. Uh, and if I'll give one book option for the beard that I wanted more than anything else that the show never gave us, and that's Dario Naharis with his blonde oh, yeah. mustache and the, and the tri-tipped uh, blue beard. That, I wanted that so bad they never gave it to us. Yeah, there's there's not enough blue hair on the show. It has to be no, said. They should definitely enough. do a bit more. Um, uh, Marvin Martin asks, uh, does Cersei think she can beat the Night King on her own? Um, I think that's a really interesting question. So show question. Um, I, I think that she's actually put that to one side and thought, do you know what? I... I'm going to try and pit the Night King against Danny, allow them to beat each other up, and then whoever survives is going to be in a weakened state, and then I can take them on. That seems to be her plan, rather than thinking that she can just take the Night King on, on, on her own. I think she's thinking that she's going to let her two enemies fight it out, and then whoever limps down towards King's Landing at the end, she will be able to take on probably with the help of whatever Kyburn comes up with a, um, an, an army of, uh, of 
science rights or, or, or scorpions or whatever else he's got up his sleeve. Uh, any thoughts on that one, Jarrah? No, I'm, I'm pretty much with you on that one uh, straight across. So, yeah, but no, we're good. Awesome. Uh, and then we had uh, Zoom Zoom, uh, $10. Thank you so much. We could be blindsided by D&D &D, uh, by having Sansa be the one to off Cersei. After all, Sansa almost pushed Joffrey to his death. Um, uh, by the way, no oranges or lemons in Bravos. Uh, I've covered the oranges and lemons thing in Bravos. I, I respectfully disagree, except as the end of the line is, except for the courts and the gardens of the rich and the mighty. Um, that is where they do reside. Um, uh, in terms of Sansa, I think my uh, growing conclusion, uh, which I don't think is particularly controversial is that Sansa is turning into the Lady of Winterfell and staying in the north. She's done her King's Landing thing. I don't think Cersei's going to come up to the north. I don't think uh, Sansa's going to go back down to the south, except possibly in the very last episode in the kind of a wrapping up all the loose ends way. Um, so I don't think that she herself will be uh, killing Cersei. I think that um, even if she were there in a position to, uh, with the authority to do it, uh, we saw what happened with Littlefinger. Sansa honestly wanted, would have wanted to kill him herself, but she had Arya do it. And I think that is a much more likely way. Sansa doesn't dirty her hands with these things herself. She has other people to do stuff. JR, any thoughts on that one? Nope, I'm good on that one. Oh, excellent. Yeah, you, you're always so great at explaining it. It, it, it kills me because I'm like, I, even when I would bond all the time on your channel, I'm like, oh, I totally agree with Robert. <laughs> that's uh, I'm like, oh yeah, no, that's exactly what I think too. It's funny. Well, well, all right. I'll, I'll let you have first uh, first bash on this next one, which is also from Jack Hurst, who who asked the excellent beard question a moment ago. Um, recently rewatched uh, mine and LML's three hour epic live stream. So I remember that one well. That went deep into the night discussing the Lannisters, and you both seemed pretty sure Cersei will die. Where would you put Cersei on a scale of 1 to 100 about uh, whether she will die in season 8? So this is a sort of a, uh, I won't ask you to put, put a number on it, JR, but do you think she will survive? Uh, how yeah. confident are you? Uh, I'll, I'll put a number on it. I'll go ahead and give it a 100. She is definitely going to die. She's marked for death. It, there's no two ways about it. Jamie is a question mark. Tyrion's a question mark, but certainly Cersei will die. She, she's going to succumb to her own uh, ineptness and ultimately fail herself. And I, I honestly think uh, I like my theory, so I'm going to stick with it. So, no, she dies in the neck. One way or another. <laughs> St stick by your theory. I like it. Um, I, would, I would agree. I think she will die. I think she's going to die in this kind of um final bit um so i think that there's going to be the big confrontation with the night king and all the rest of it and then this kind of scouring of the shire kind of end thing that they have in fact that they've had in every season pretty much of game of thrones so far where you have the big battle confrontation in pardon me in the penultimate episode and then the final episode is kind of tying up all the loose strings and i think that she may well even survive until the very last episode one of these and, little loose things to be told. I, do, I don't think it'll be that way in the books, honestly. I think Fagon is going to be who have to, they have to unseat at King's Landing. I, I don't think Danny is going to have to face Cersei. I think Fagon and his forces are going to ultimately end up in control of King's Landing in some some way or form. But that's what I see happening in the books. Yeah, I think you may well be right. I think Fagon will definitely capture Storm's End. And I think that they will then move on King's Landing. And it's a matter of the timing of that and Danny's return as to exactly what happens um, there, whether he's going to be uh, sieging it or not. I think that in terms of the Cersei death, the one thing that I always come back to uh, just as a small side thought, I think that she will die. But I think that there's a small side thought that I always try and drop into people's minds which is that this is not a story which is going to end with all of the good guys surviving and all of the bad guys dying. That's not how no, this no, is going to end. No, it's always meant to be in this morally gray area. So who is exactly. a good guy and who is a bad guy? It's just a matter of perspective. And that's very well, personal. It, it is. But I think that what I, would, what I would just sort of flag up is that I think that uh, 
we have to accept that there will be some characters or at least a character that we do not like corporately we do not like that survives and so i think we need to start thinking about who might the this character or these characters be some of them i think so euron i think is just too mad bad and dangerous to survive i think he has to go uh, that's the one everybody seems to glob onto is euron surviving and i'm like oh no he's He's so far gone. He's he's Ramsey, Bolden, and Joffrey mixed in with a whole lot worse, and that's your yeah. Euron. So no, he's got to go. Yeah, I, I agree. So so there's that. I think Ramsey will die as well in the books. Um, for me, I think the character who possibly is most likely that we don't necessarily like, possibly most likely to survive, is someone like Kyburn, who I think is such a social climber and social ingratiator and also clever enough to see when the writing's on the wall and get out of there. So I think that there's, it's entirely possible that someone like him might survive. But And, and a Theon, somebody that's been demonized and, and then torn apart. Uh, Theon, you know, is kind of in that category too, because a lot of people hate him for what he did to the Starks, which wasn't necessarily all him. Part of it was Ramsay. Uh, Theon's one of those ones that'll end up surviving as well, I think. And it's just because of, one, that fact, and, and two, he's endured so much already. Yeah, yeah, I agree. But I think I think Theon is quite cliche, but I think he is on a redemption arc. So I think by the end of it, I think we're all um, kind of appreciating See, the whole but, yeah, Let me ask you this, Robert. Do you think it takes away from the other uh, redemptive arcs that are very well established to have Theon in sort of the same uh, area that Jamie's kind of occupying, for example? You know, like, what do you think? No, I don't think so, because I think they're on different arcs. So um, what, uh, I mean, I love, everyone loves the quote, but the idea of the cripples, bastards and broken things, yep. what seems to be George R. R. Martin's way of who we're actually supposed to start emoting with are these people. And the people that have been broken by whatever the story has thrown at them. And so we have we start, they, they might not be characters that we initially liked, but we start to emote with them because they get broken. They get taken down to the bottom point and they slowly climb their way back up. And we see that with characters like Sandor. We, when we first met him, we didn't like him, but then we started to see him and he got broken by events and he started to crawl back up again. Jamie similarly is, is, is the way. Theon is the ultimate. He was literally psychologically, physically broken down and he's had to crawl his way back up again. So I think these are the kinds of characters that, that we're being drawn to like and to cheer on because of that arc. And everybody's arc is slightly different, but there are a lot of them. So I don't think it, it belittles Jamie's arc because Theon's on a similar kind of like down and then back up again. I think that is just the the way that it kind of works. Sans has got a very similar kind of one where she starts off very bright and happy and then gets taken down, down and down. And then you see in the show that she's starting to pick herself back up with uh, again. And the the particularly the show fandom, I've seen a shift with with Sansa over the years. As I myself have shifted, I didn't much like her character in season one. But then each season, I've started to like and respect her more as it's gone on. So I don't think it changes or belittles one person's journey if another one person's gone through a, a journey that echoes. I think that echoing stories is very much something that George R. R. Martin does. Right. Um, and, uh, Mar Marvin Martin, uh, again, with another $2 donation. Seriously, thank you, Martin, for asking some really great questions. Uh, only three prophesized kids. Why is Cersei pregnant? It's a good question. Uh, so there are a number of options on this one. Uh, either she's not, she's just pretending, or uh, she's uh, she is pregnant and the, the baby's not actually going to be born or is still born or something along those lines. Or um, uh, the the prophecy, and I've, I've heard a lot of people suggest this, is that the, the, the younger, younger child, the, the little brother, is the child she dies in childbirth that's all i think all of these are entirely possible um so the what i would say is the maggie the frog seems to be right on everything so far so i would uh, i wouldn't dispute that at, at this moment 
Um, right. And, and this kind of also throws back into the whole Gendry question, because in the show, it's very much alluded to that Gendry is uh, born of Cersei and Robert uh, being the black haired beauty that she speaks of in season one, talking to Catelyn Stark. It's so how many kids are there actually now? So there's three that are actually born of Jamie and Cersei. And then maybe Gendry question mark and maybe this new one question mark. We don't know. Well, I don't think, I think um, he isn't, Gendry isn't definitely in the books. Uh, that's correct. That scene was made up just for the, um, the show this, when they're kind of reminiscing about this child that, that, um, uh, that they lost uh, as a way to try and show the relationship between those two characters. Cause they felt that actually, as they'd been going along, they hadn't, um, developed that before the fact that Rob, before Robert died, and they so they created that. So so that idea there is is um, um, quite a, a show only one. And I personally, I although yes, you could interpret that as being uh, that this is uh, that, that the person there with Gendry. That it's very clear that all of and this is a big part of the plot of season one, book one. All of Robert Baratheon's children had the black hair. So um, it could have been any of them, or as they said, that one, it just died. What, what, I don't personally see any reason why we should assume that, that uh, uh, somehow the child which was born completely naturally within that marriage should suddenly end up being treated like a bastard child somewhere. That doesn't quite work for me. So I don't think that for me, that implication was there. Uh, Chrome, thank you so much for the the ten dollars. Uh, there's no question attached to. Oh, I think there might yes, be one. Yes, there is. Saying, "Will Sansa die for Arya, like Lady died for Nymeria?" That's an excellent uh, thought. Um, I don't think so uh, personally. I think that the uh, the the names of the um, the, the, the dire wolves are clearly very much linked across to the fates of their owners. But I don't think that just because one dire wolf died in the place of another one means that one of the uh, the Starks will die in the place of the other one. I can't I can't see that happening. And personally, I don't I don't see how Cersei would do that or why she would do that. That's not doesn't quite work for me. Uh, did you, Jr? Did you have a or could you imagine? Uh, you know, I, I, I kind of the, the only way I would kind of like that uh, would be if the names were reversed. So if uh, since Lady died for Nymeria, what about Arya dying for Sansa to uh, replace the debt? The sort of the balancing of the scales. That would be the only way I would kind of like that. Um, but no, I'm not. I'm not big on that one. No. Okay. I, I think that's fair enough. Mazamonti, thank you so much. At five pounds. It's just a comment, I think, rather than a question. Theon dreamt that he feasted with the dead. He's going to die. Uh, yeah, I don't... Uh, I, I, I'm i never sure with Theon. I think that there's a good chance that he could well survive uh, as one of these cripples, bastards, and broken things. I don't think we have to take every dream as being completely right. But yes, there is definitely kind of a, a hint of that there. The, you always have to ask with dreams. So one, one moment, JR. You always have to yeah, ask with dreams... Are they placed by somebody else or are they just to some kind of natural foreshadowing of what is going on? But sorry, go on. Uh, his dreams just don't seem to be the, the prolific type. They're, they're not there to give us anything. Uh, it's dreams that people have about him seem to come true. Uh, the sea coming to Winterfell, the ocean coming to Winterfell, um, you know, when Theon takes over Winterfell. That makes sense, but it's about him. It's not his dream. So I, I I don't see a lot of correlation between Theon's dreams and actually things actually coming to fruition. Yeah, I think that's fair. There, there's no hint that he's got any particular magical powers, um, and so I don't think that we necessarily should take it seriously. That doesn't mean he's not going to die, but I don't think we should necessarily take uh, take it uh, too seriously. <laughs> right. Um, Catherine Scully, thank you so much. Uh, five Canadian dollars. Um, uh, I always love it. I, was, I, was, I have no idea what five Canadian dollars is, but that's very generous of the, 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 what it's worth. Right? That's very generous super chat nonetheless. Um, there is a theory that Renly is Robert's son, not his brother. What do you think? Um, well, I have to admit, I'd have to go back and have a look at their relative 
ages. I don't honestly know the the, the relative ages there to see whether it's actually uh, possible. Um, I don't, uh, in the absence any of any evidence, and I've not seen any evidence, then I would say probably not, because it doesn't make sense for a, um, uh, a, a bastard child of Robert Baratheon to suddenly be adopted and pretended that he's a brother, because there was no need for the family to do that. Um, but yes, I've, I think my short answer is I've not seen any evidence to suggest that that is the case. Added to which, he's not that much like Robert Baratheon. The, the three brothers are very different, uh, the three of them, there, and Stannis, obviously, and, and Renly doesn't, doesn't seem to be a natural uh, son to, uh, to Robert. Um, have, do you know of any evidence? Uh, I I don't know of much evidence to support that at all. And and Renly, what at the time of the crash or the shipwreck in Stormbreaker Bay, uh, Renly was quite young, very young. But Robert was equally as young. Like Robert was ten or eleven years old when that happened. Stannis was like eight, and Renly was you know still in diapers. I mean, he was like three or four when it happened. Uh, because they were ultimately raised by uh, uh, who is it, Crescent Maester Crescent? Uh, well, yeah, effectively, yeah, yeah, that's that's really who, who raised all three of them, uh, in absence of their parents. So, yeah, no, I just don't see a lot of evidence for there. I think Robert would have been too young, and it, the timeline for me doesn't fit. Yeah, there's a couple of people in the chat, Vanessa Amesty and uh, Kelso Sunshine saying that Renly's only about 12 years younger. So uh, I hope not is the is the aunt is what they both say. Yeah, yeah uh, I'm, with, so uh, I'm with that as well. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't doesn't seem to make sense. Uh, but good question. Um, let's go. I've got, I think, three more questions from my patrons. Um, uh, so let's try and wrap this up. Uh, in the next 10 or 15 minutes, if that's okay with you, JR. Um, yeah, whatever works. Uh, so Torsten D um, is asking a show question about the dragon pit scene. Now, um, this is uh, a question saying, first, Cersei declined any sort of cooperation with the Targaryen allies, um, and everyone seemed to accept it reluctantly. After the talk with Tyrion, so Tyrion then went and chatted to her he not only accepted a truce, but offered her help in the war against the others. But she was lying, obviously. Uh, so she didn't change her plans after talking to Tyrion, uh, but only she changed her honesty. Is there any explanation uh, that we can think of for why that might be? I mean, I think that there are a couple of possibilities here. Um, so she may well have gone into the whole thing realising that people would not believe her if she straight away just said, what, there's some big bad up north. Tyrion certainly wouldn't necessarily believe it if she was suddenly immediately brought, uh, brought into it all and said, yes, and I'll send my army up to fight with you. Tyrion would be suspicious to start with. So if she were wishing to uh, actually convince people that she was being truthful, she would um, start off by uh, declining it. She would, as the hint was she would get someone like Euron to uh, to make a big song and dance and rush off, um, and then it make to make her look like she was in a weaker position, and then change her mind. So that works for me that she was planning all of that all along in order to try and convince people that she was actually uh, right. The second one is uh, if we try and give her a little bit of credit is that uh, maybe she didn't know what she was going to find there um, and then she just wanted to go away and have a think about it um, because uh, she was shown the white. She went away. She would have then talked to um, Kyburn, who, let's not forget, was very interested in that. Uh, and maybe Kyburn would have come up with the plan of, you know what, the best way of getting through this is to send that lot up north and then we can use the time that we've bought to um, uh, sort of make sure that Prepare we... Prepare the defence. Exactly. Got ourselves sorted in the south. We can get the army in. Uh, we just need a little bit of time. <coughs> so uh, I think that 
those are the two options. Either of them seem to work well for me. I would just say on the Tyrion thing, because a lot of people do wonder about this idea of perhaps did Tyrion, uh, is he about to betray, did he promise something to Cersei and is he actually about to betray Danny? The one thing that I would say is that it seems very clear to me, particularly now we've seen these pictures, Jamie is going to arrive up at Winterfell very, very soon, probably in episode one. If Tyrion did have any doubt about the fact that uh, Cersei was going to betray them, that would just get squashed straight away. He will know straight away that Cersei has betrayed them. And as a result, any deal that he personally had with Cersei is also therefore going to be off the cards. So uh, I, th I think we can squash this idea that Tyrion is going to be uh, cunningly kind of working for... Exactly. Yeah, I mean, no. that doesn't mean... I don't think he's won't necessarily flip in terms of there's also the John situation, but that's an entirely different um, uh, avenue. Uh, but do, 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 what were your thoughts on that that whole uh, change of mind by Cersei and Tyrion possibly coming to a deal? Did you have any ideas on that one? Uh, ultimately, it, when it comes to the show, because it's inherently a show-only question, obviously... Um, they needed time to fill and they had to fill it with something and had to breed hate and discontent for other characters that wouldn't normally have it. And so this is kind of what we're left with. Uh, I don't think there's anything to it. I think it's going to be, if there was a deal, it's null and void when she doesn't send her forces North. All Cersei's done is bought time. And Jamie is going North probably with Braun because he can't film in King's Landing with Lena Headey. Uh, it was just a way to get move stuff around on the board and, and create some other alternatives popping up. I think it's a red herring. Good. I think we're in agreement on that one then. Uh, Jack Hurst saying, uh, thank you again for another super chat. That's very kind. Uh, just translating the dog's super chat, super chat bark. I don't quite understand that sentence, uh, but I think there's some chat going on uh, uh, that sort of leads up to this. The question is, if white walkers are made of ice, how do <laughs> several of them have beards? Which is, an for example, the one John killed at Hardhome. Excellent question. I think the answer is that they're not just made of ice. Um, the others, George R. R. Martin has uh, been quite clear on, they're not undead. They are a different form of life. Um, they're just a different type of, of existence. And, so, and they have a language which is Skrillic, and they have yeah. uh, they're ultimately their own culture into themselves, but we don't understand anything about them. Exactly. So, so the whole uh, concept of of facial hair and things like that, we the honest answer is we do not know, but we just have to accept it as a fact that some of them have got facial hair. I found it highly amusing that the. Uh, the cave paintings that, that they went, John and Danny seemed to discover <laughs> between Dad and so The Night King seemed to have a beard, but then later on he seems not to have a beard. And I, I had a lot of, uh, I amused myself for a long time trying to work out whether or not this was him. Had he just learned how to shave or was it a completely different person? What was going on there? But Well, yeah. well of course he learned how to shave. He sharpened up that uh, javelin that he threw like an Olympian <laughs> and, and was just trimming up nicely, wasn't he? Absolutely. So he's just getting into shape for season uh, season eight. Um, <laughs> Karis the Beast uh, over on Patreon uh, asks, Cersei is always said to have genuinely loved her children in spite of her many untoward characteristics. Um, when? It seems to me that they're only extension of her own ego and that's what she was um, nurturing. I think this sort of comes back actually to the, the things that you're talking right at the top actually, JR, about even right. if we say that she is narcissistic, that doesn't mean that she necessarily doesn't love her children. And, and, is that and, right? As, as he perfectly pointed out, is that they are extensions of her own. Uh, much like Tywin bangs on about uh, the family name is all that lives on after we're all dead, right? This is sort of her version of Tywin's uh, speech about house being the most important thing ever. Uh, this is her narcissistic extension. Uh, of taking care of and loving after her children because they are an extension of her. And ultimately she's still doing it to wield power no matter what. So it's very, a circular thing within the narcissistic ideals that, you know, by having them on the throne, she's still retaining power. Yeah. 
Yeah, I, I, I agree. And I think that also there was uh, the, the, the loss of her children is kind of symbolic of the, uh, the loss of what she, she lives for outside of herself. And so what what we see is that the, uh, she she lives not just for herself to start with, but also for all three of her children and Jamie. And as she loses each of those children, and then finally as she loses Jamie, we see less and less of her care about the outside world. And so she actually goes back in to herself. So season eight, Cersei, is going to be very much just in of herself. And that perhaps is when we see uh the kind of the mental illnesses that we've been talking about just to play out a whole lot more because the the outlet for any kind of love and care and compassion for the outside world has gone so actually it's just going to be her and and all about her um guys we've got one more question from a patron uh that i want to answer so uh now is the chance if you've got any more questions to drop them in the chat um uh, Donna Daly is the, the final question uh, from Patreon, uh, saying, uh, while Cersei is reasonably, reasonably competent in the show, I personally don't think she is in the books. Do you think it likely that she will be made Queen Cersei first of her name, blah, 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 in the books as well? She wrote the blah, 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 not me. Um, so uh, I would agree that um, in the books, she does not come across as being particularly strategic in thinking. Uh, it, she doesn't come across as, as doing many particularly clever moves. On the show, she does seem to come across a lot more as, to start with, quite a blunt instrument that is quite effective, like, for example, blowing up the Great Sept is, you know, quite effective at doing what she wanted it to do. Uh, it eliminated her opposition. It allowed her to be in a position to be made queen. So that was quite effective. In season seven of the show, uh, one of the things that I personally didn't like so much was the fact that, that there seemed to be a switch around between Tyrion and Cersei in terms of who was the cleverest, who could outsmart the other. Uh, Tyrion, in my mind, is the clever strategic thinker. And yet Cersei did seem to be um, uh, outsmarting him at every turn. I think that's largely show uh, doing shortcuts uh, just to get the action. Uh, out of necessity. Exactly. It was easier just to say Cersei's come up with this plan than come up with some uh, convoluted thing with, with you know, Kyburn or, or, or the you know her spy network or anything along those lines. So I think that was just a shortcut. But in answer to the question, and I'll come to you on this a moment in this one, Jr. Um, do I think she will be made queen in the books as well? Yes, I do. I think that that broad arc is going to go the way that it does uh, on the show. I think that she will become queen. Uh, and I think that she will be the kind of queen that we all imagine that she is, um, uh, at, which is not dissimilar to the show, but with slightly less uh, strategic insight. Uh, JR, did you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, is, I, I think she'll remain as regent and die as regent. I don't think she's going to have or wield any power as the actual queen in the books. I, I just don't see it as being uh, really plausible. Fair enough. Uh, two super chats just to pick up on. Um, and while I do these, uh, JR, do you want to have a quick look through the chat, see if there's any other uh, questions that perhaps yep, you we finish on? Uh, Rebecca Saunter, thank you so much. Just saying, um, uh, just for the little support I can send. I, I honestly appreciate anyone who sends a super chat. It's um, uh, it, it's really touching for me. And, and uh, just in terms of... Uh, helping highlight stuff it's it's great so uh thank you uh kids 28 ten dollars saying as always it's been a pleasure robert thank you so much that's very kind um uh marvin martin again thank you saying uh, i recommend legacy of cain lots of parallels i will check that out um jr is there is there anything that you spotted in particular in the chat it would be good for us just to sort of uh, uh there, there's a couple of ones because we we glossed over it um uh Tracy pay for life and at Kelso sunshine. What is the deal with bronze actor? So the deal with that is uh, Jerome Flynn and Lena Headey, who is Cersei dated in real life. And they're both have in their contracts and in their writers that they're not allowed to film scenes together. 
because of the bad breakup that happened when Jerome Flynn was actually part of a boy band. Uh, it goes way back in history, but they're not allowed to film together because not great things happen on set when they're together. So that was, uh, I'll address that one because I know what that was about. Robert, do you want to say anything about the dating habits of Braun? I, I have absolutely nothing to say about the dating habits of, of Braun or Jerome Flynn, um, or, or indeed Robson Green for, for fans of 90s uh, <laughs> British uh, rubbish pop. Ah, there we go. Um, Marvin Martin asked, uh, is Jamie traumatized by Aries disillusionment and judgment? Does Cersei contribute to uh, the hold over him? And is Brienne also restoring his faith, so to speak? Uh, yes, Jamie is traumatized, but not for the reasons that a lot of people think. He certainly displays uh, PTSD symptoms, but it's not from what he did to save so many people. It's everybody's reaction to what he did to save so many people. He, Jamie's kind of uh, that point in Batman where he stops and says, uh, I, I'm what Gotham needed at that time. That's that's kind of what he is. He, he's this moldable character that can fit many different roles based on what the people of King's Landing or Westeros by extension need. He is literally whatever they need. He's the utilitarian. He's whatever they need him to be, he'll be. He wants you want him to be the Kingslayer, fine, he'll be the Kingslayer. You want him to be a Kinslayer, fine, he'll be a Kinslayer. Uh, and that's just part of Jamie's character and arc. Um, and yes, absolutely, Brian is restoring faith in uh, what he believes, but he's also pointing out that the high hypocrisy of being a knight and swearing so many vows because you can't possibly get through them all without. Uh, tromping over another one, right? It, it becomes too much. And, and that's, you know, what he very adequately or very poignantly explains to Brienne is at some point you have to stop and go, you have to do what you think is morally right in the, uh, at the point of the decision, not with everything else in tow. Yeah, I, I agree. And I think that the, when I was going back in my series, looking at uh, Robert's rebellion, it, it really struck me about the fact that Jamie had done what he considered a hugely heroic act, uh, not just killing uh, the, the Mad King, he also went and hunted down the pyromancers who were going to do the deed, uh, and he just stopped the whole thing happening. And he effectively sort of collapsed in this, as you say, slightly traumatised heap on the Iron Throne, and was the the, the person to come in was Ned, and Ned immediately judged him, uh, made assumptions that he was actually trying to claim the throne for himself. And Jamie had to respond to that, and his way psychologically seems to be to go, okay, well, I don't care what people think. I know what I did was right, and I'm going to build up this shell around me of uh, you can, you can, you know, as Tyrion often says, you know, if, if people throw names at you, use it as armor. That's that's what it was, and he did his own version of that. Um, and where the scene with Brienne in the bath, which is beautiful, and on the show, it, that why it's so powerful is that he's actually letting her in. He never told people his story, and past that, the walls, yeah, exactly. And that was it because he it, that that was his big traumatic moment because he broke all his visions and dreams of what it was to be a king's guard him upholding his vows all of that he broke at that moment and so he had to start again and recreate his character of who he was uh, and i do sometimes wonder to myself uh, ned obviously is a great character in many ways but what would have happened if ned had just like gone there and, and let's like and ask the question. And ask how, the question. How hard what, was it just on? to ask a question? And, and this is this is where I get so frustrated with people that want to tout the Ned Stark banner like so high and for so long. It's like, how simple would it have been to ask a question? What happened? Why is the king dead? Why are you sitting on the throne? And what in God's name is going on here? Like, how easy would that have been? And he didn't. He judged yeah. him automatically as soon as he walked in. Exactly. And I, and I think that how different would the world be if that had happened and actually Jamie had been treated as a hero, not as somebody who was um, uh, trying to claim the throne for himself. 
so that's uh, it's it's a big what if. I don't think we'll ever know, but but no. that that was the moment that really shaped him. Uh, Donna Daly, thank you so much uh, for the the the. the Quick super chat, uh, five pounds. That's very kind. Sorry, I missed the first hour. I don't know if this has been asked. Do you think that Cersei will lose all her children in the books? I think we've sort of answered that one. I think my answer is yes. JR, would you uh, agree? I, and I'm with that too. So far, Maggie the Frog has been spot on with prophecy. Uh, we've speculated greatly on uh, what the Voluncar is and how it'll happen. Uh, but yeah, I, I think ultimately she will lose Marcella Tommen and Joffrey's already dead. So uh, Marcella and Tommen, unfortunately, are marked for death in the books. Yeah, I I would I would agree. It's uh, it's going to be tragic, and it's a, a an essential part of Cersei's descent uh, into the person that we see her on the show. Um, I think I'll round up there. Just actually, uh, uh, Tracy Petey for life uh, with a really astute point saying. I think most everyone is traumatized at this point. Uh, I think that's very true. I think <laughs> if you look across across the piece of the characters we have in A Song of Ice and Fire, the, 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 I think you would have to be inhuman not to be affected by everything that's that's gone on there. So, uh, so yeah, everybody has. Uh, I think it. some of us are traumatized as book readers. I remember the first time <laughs> that I that I read The Red Wedding, and I it was during finals at the university, and I literally threw that book across the room and didn't pick it up for two weeks reading that. I did not. It sat slumped in the corner of my room, uh, just like it was after I got done throwing it there. <laughs> Excellent. I, I, th I think many people can emote with that. It's, it was, it was a, a horrific moment um, of, of many horrific moments. And I, th I think oh, I yeah. just, <laughs> on the show, on the show with Hodor, I just, I, that for me. I still, that's, really that's still a hard scene to watch. I mean, yeah. it, cause Hodor is like the innocent, you know, and it, it's, it's just that representation of that true innocence. And he's probably one of the only ones that you could say that about in all of Westeros. And yeah, it's just a, a hard one to watch. Um, absolutely. But guys, we're, we're, we're going away from the uh, topic as we always do. Uh, but uh, let's just round it off there. JR, uh, thank you so much for coming on. It's been an absolute pleasure. So, so uh, many fantastic points you've been making. Do you want to remind everyone where they can find you on the interwebs? Absolutely. Thank you for having me, Robert. I actually really appreciate it. Normally, you all see me uh, as a mod in the chats. Um, uh, JR from Geek Chat One, uh, please come and join the chat. That's what we're there for. Uh, you can find us on Facebook under Geek Chat One. Uh, we have a small and growing YouTube channel, uh, Geek Chat One, obviously on YouTube, uh, Instagram and Twitter, all, all the sort of it. And we just have great conversations about all sorts of things geek. That's what we're here for. It's what we enjoy and love doing. And that's what we try to bring you all in on. And uh, it's, you know, good time. Excellent. And uh, as, as I say, I only invite people on here if I personally rate them. And JR is, is one of the good people. I would highly recommend uh, that when this finishes in just a moment, you go over, find Geek Chat One and you subscribe there. If we can, if we can get that up, uh, pushing up towards a thousand subscribers, I think you're somewhere around 500 and something at the moment. Uh, deserves a lot more. Uh, so if you could go and do that, that would be fantastic. And, so guys, and if you, you want to so see much. Kyle tomorrow as Kyle Lisi, if it hits a thousand before tomorrow, Kyle's promised to uh, go ahead and don the great uh, blonde crown of Kyle Lisi again for the entire stream tomorrow with Gemma. Well, I'm not entirely sure whether that's a promise or a threat, I have to say. but It's, uh, it's, a, it's uh, a mixed <laughs> bag, isn't it? <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it's, it's definitely a mixed bag. Guys, uh, uh, thank you so much. We had a fantastic chat going on there. Apologies if we didn't get a chance to get to your question. Thank you so much for all the super chats. Patrons, I say it every time, thank you. I honestly cannot do this without you. If you are interested in... Um, uh, getting more involved in in Deep Geek and supporting the channel or getting a bit of uh, uh, access to some additional stuff that I do just over on Patreon, then please do go check out um, patreon.com slash indiegeek, link down in the description. Thank you, guys. We'll be back at the same time next week. Just uh, while I think of it, there was one other question uh, from one of my patrons about whether I'm still thinking of doing a live stream on a more UK or Europe friendly time. Yes, I'm hoping for not this weekend, but next weekend. So hopefully do that then. But take care, everyone. We will definitely be back same time next week. See you soon. Salute.